became my friend, my teacher, and my savior. This man was from Nazareth of Galilee. It was near the same region where I'm from. And there was a group of people that got together and we followed him wherever he went. And he went everywhere proclaiming the word of the kingdom. And that wasn't a new concept for me because I'm a Jew and we're used to that. But there was something different about him. There was something different about the way that he spoke. There was something different about the way that he taught. And there was something different about the way that he touched. Everywhere that he went, he went to places that you would think people would never go. He went to places even where the people there wanted to kill him. And yet, that never stopped him from going. And along the way, we saw him do things that we thought only God could do. He healed the sick. He healed lepers. He told the lame walk, and they did. And he even brought people back to life. I became loyal to this man. I became loyal to him. I would go anywhere, and I would do anything with him, even if that meant death. That is how loyal I became. To give you an example, I remember when our beloved friend Lazarus passed away. And we had just fleed the region where Lazarus lived because some of the Jews there were attempting to kill our teacher. And I remember when we received the sad news, some of the others that were with us questioned saying, Teacher, surely just a short while ago, the Jews there tried to kill you, and yet you're going back? And when he told us plainly that Lazarus had died, he said to us, I am glad for, it's for my sake, for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. And so let us go. And we didn't realize what that meant yet, but we were going to soon find out what he meant by that statement. And at that point, I was all in. I was ready to go. And I turned to encourage the rest of the team who was kind of doubting at the time. And I said, let us go with him also so that we may also die. Because if my teacher was willing to give his life to go to visit Lazarus, then I wanted to be willing as well. And I wanted everybody else to be willing also. But see, my favorite thing about him, the most impactful thing to me were his words. He often spoke in parables and stories, and most of the time it left us confused and wondering what they meant. There was other times he used metaphors, and there were some times they were kind of disgusting. Looking back, I remember this one time where he told us, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood. And all of us were like, that is disgusting. Like, come on, man, come on. And looking back, it threw a lot of people for a loop. They stopped following right after that. But there were other times where he spoke with such compassion and he spoke with such authority that no matter what was holding you back, it broke those down and you were gripped by every word that he spoke. And then you were often left to ponder and to reflect on the words that he said. See, I'm a pretty curious person and I really like to learn. And one of the things I learned about being around him is that he wasn't really afraid of my investigation. He wasn't afraid of my questions. And I remember on one occasion, one memorable occasion, we were gathered together to celebrate the Passover feast. And he looked at all of us around the table and he said, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And then he said a few minutes later after that, he said, you know the way to the place where I am going. So I just took a couple glances, looked around the room a little bit, and I could tell that there wasn't a single one of us who knew what in creation he was talking about. And so I asked, and I said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how are we to know the way to get to where you're going? And I knew that was exactly the question everyone else in the room was not daring to ask. But because of my curiosity, it led me to investigate a little more. And he responded 
with one of the most profound statements of all time. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And I remember a short time after that, everything changed. Everything changed. We had followed this man for three years. We had seen him do incredible things. We believed that he was the one, the Messiah, the one that was coming to conquer Rome and to establish this kingdom of which he so often spoke. And we were ready. And we were committed. And then we saw him accused. And then we saw him beaten and whipped. And then we saw him carrying the cross on his back upon which he was going to be crucified. And we saw him hanging from that tree as he gave his last breath. And you better believe at that moment that every single one of us we're doubting. Every single one of us we're doubting. Is this really what it was about? Is this really what we've been going through all this stuff for? Was, was this all just for nothing? No, I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that. And I remember it was the beginning of the week, and I wasn't with the rest of the disciples because they were locked in a room because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And to be honest, it was not a bad thing to think about because they were probably coming for us next in order to squash any type of rebellion or anything that would come up from the death of him. But I couldn't do it. After all that has happened, I could not even imagine spending myself day after day and night after night locked away in a room. I just couldn't. It didn't matter to me if I was recognized. It didn't matter to me if I was caught because my Messiah just died. And I remember that night, I was coming back to the house, and as they let me in, I was bombarded by voices. They were talking over each other, and they were screaming over each other, and all of them were saying, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord, and they're all excited. And I was, I was taken back. I was shocked. And one of them even tried to explain to me what all had happened, and I had to cut him off. And I said, no. I, I can't believe that. And the thought came into my head, man, this is exactly why I didn't want to be locked in a room, because they're all mad. And now I'm the only sane one in the group. And I responded to them and I said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where those nails were, and I place my hand into his side, I will not believe. And everyone calmed down after that because they realized how serious those words meant. I mean, could you even imagine being in this place where I was so loyal to him? I was ready to go to the grave with him, and yet I sat here alive while he dead. And then the rest of them have the audacity to say that they've seen him while I'm confused and I'm hurt, and I'm grieving. I mean, could you even imagine if that were really true? The fact that I was the only one who wasn't there. I mean, put yourselves in my sandals for a second. You better believe I doubt it. But at the same time, something deep within me began to stir. There was a small glimmer of hope that began to rise. And over the next several days, we spent together in this house. And I noticed there was something different about the group. Yes, yes, they were still afraid, but they were excited. And life had come back into their faces, and life had come back into their conversations. And I remember sitting there, listening to Peter and John recall their journey running down to the tomb and finding it empty. And to be honest, after about the fifth day, they needed to find a new story. That's all they talked about. <laughs> and I remember on the seventh day, 
we're all sitting there and we're listening to John tell us for the seventh time about how he beat Peter to the tomb when we all know the women beat everyone there. <laughs> right. And here I am sitting, staring off into space, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he appeared right through the wall. Right through the wall. And in that moment, I was filled with such terror and such amo uh, amazement. And I looked around at everyone else to see if they could see what I was seeing with my eyes. And they were staring back at me with this look of, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we felt the first time it happened to us. <laughs> and I turned back to him, and we locked eyes. Those eyes that are so full and deep of compassion and grace. Those eyes that pierced through every doubt and every fear that was coursing through my veins. And I remember trying with every bit of who I was to break the eye contact, and I couldn't. And then he spoke. He said, peace be with you. And in that moment, the entire world faded away. I forgot there was even people in the room. And he looked at me, and he said, Thomas, Come and put your fingers in the holes in my wrists and put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And I reached out my hand as it was trembling and I could feel my faith rising. I could feel life coming back into my bones. I could feel fullness of joy coming back, and the only words that I could say were my Lord and my God. And I was never the same, and I never doubted again. And I learned one of the most important lessons of my life that day, that sometimes doubt isn't always a bad thing, because sometimes doubt forces you to investigate something until you are confident that you know it. And what I learned from him was that he was not afraid of my investigation. He was not afraid of my doubt. And he's not afraid of yours either. And you can come to him with any question. You can even ask him to reveal himself to you, and he will. Because at the end of it all, all he wants is for you to know him. And so I encourage you, with anything that you can do, with all of you, do that. Seek after him and to know him. Be curious. Be doubtful. And let that lead you to Christ. And who is his name? <laughs>